Welcome to A Moment in Crime, a feature vignette presented by the True Crime Man's Dark Imagination YouTube channel. If you've enjoyed this presentation or any other presentation on this channel, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell in order to receive notifications on any further offerings on this channel. In the early 20th century, the city of Abertillery was the largest town in the area known as Monmouthshire, England, second only to Newport. The city was known for its extensive coal mining, but later became the home for several department stores. At its commercial height, Abertillery could boast of main shopping areas and a growing human population. But in the early 1920s, this small community was stricken with the deaths of two young girls that brought to the forefront a killer, one so brutal and so merciless that he is believed to have continued his reign of terror as a much older man. On the morning of Saturday, February 5, 1921, Frida Burnell, eight years old, left her home on Earl Street to run a small errand for her father by picking up some poultry grit and spice from Mortimer's Corn Store in Somerset Street, just a short distance from her residence. A few hours passed when Frida's father, Fred, went looking for his daughter through the streets of Abitillary. Fred first went to the shop where Frida should have been shopping. The young assistant at the shop, a 15-year-old teenager named Harold Jones, informed Fred that Frida had been there at approximately 9.05 a.m. right after the store opened and left 10 minutes later. Fred continued his search for the next six hours, enlisting a lot of the townspeople to help him find his little girl. Finally, he went to the police and they organized a larger search. Meanwhile, local law enforcement went to speak with the Jones boy once again, but they found he was no help whatsoever. Even though the winter light faded, the townspeople pushed through the search until about midnight, until they all agreed to continue their search on the following morning. At approximately 7.30 a.m. on the following day, February 6th, a collier, or coal miner, noticed what first appeared to be a bundle of rags on the ground on a thoroughfare known as Duke Street. The collier approached the bundle, and as he got closer to it, he realized it was the body of a young girl who appeared to have been brutalized and then murdered. Later examinations of the girl's body revealed that she was murdered in the early morning hours the day before. With the murder of Frida Burnell, police requested that detectives from Scotland Yard help with the search for the murderer. For an entire week, police questioned witnesses who may have seen the young girl walk into Mortimer's or whether she may have been seen with anyone at the time of her disappearance. Suddenly, police officers arrested the young clerk, Harold Jones, and charged him with the abduction and murder of Frida Burnell. One witness questioned by the police claimed to have heard screams coming from a shed near the rear of Mortimer's at or about the same time that young Frida had been there. Jones possessed the only key to that shed. When police searched the shed, they found a handkerchief that belonged to Frida and an axe which law enforcement believed the killer used in the attack. Harold Jones stated he had no idea what the police were talking about during the interrogations conducted and denied any knowledge of the murder. Most of the evidence held by the prosecution was circumstantial, and in a trial that took place on June 21, 1921, the jury found Jones not guilty at the Monmouth Assizes. His employer, Herbert Henry Mortimer, gave his young assistant an alibi. Mortimer later found himself forced to move because of the ostracism he received as a result of later events. Believing the young boy to be innocent, the citizens held a victory celebration in the streets of Abitillary. It appeared that denizens refused to believe that a boy like Jones could be responsible for the murder of such a sweet young girl, such as Frida Burnell. But after the disappearance of another young girl in the area, 17 days after Jones's acquittal, it proved that the jury must have been wrong in their decision. In the evening of July 8, 1921, 
Police believe that someone lured 11-year-old Flory Little to her death. Harold Jones lived just three doors down from the missing girl. The assailant pounced on the little girl with such rage and viciousness that she succumbed very quickly. When police sought to question Jones about the little girl, again he denied everything. In an attempt to deflect suspicion away from himself, Jones even helped with the search for little Flory. After searching for Flory Little throughout the streets of the town, they then conducted a house-to-house -house search. When Philip Jones, Harold's father, gladly invited the police into his home for a search, Harold knew he had been cornered. In an effort to cover his crime, the young man hid Flory's body in the attic which the police soon found in their search. As soon as the police began searching his home, young Jones left. But when they discovered Flory's body, Jones's father located him and brought him back to the residence. Officers soon arrested Harold Jones. But before the trial could take place, someone sent an anonymous note signed by someone calling themselves, quote, Duffy, end quote, to police, which read, I think it very right to kill all I can of England lad and girls. Authorities believe the note to be a hoax to deflect suspicion away from Jones. But instead, the local magistrate indicted Jones on July 22, 1921. Because of his connection to the victim, Harold Jones confessed to the murder of Flory Little and also admitted to the murder of Frida Burnell when he stated after the trial in a statement that, quote, I, Harold Jones, willfully and deliberately murdered Frida Burnell in Mortimer's shed on 5 February 1921. The reason for this act was a desire to kill, end quote. Because of his young age, Jones would not be executed because he was two months shy of his 16th birthday and on November 21, 1921, the court sentenced him to prison for the duration defined as, quote, at the king's pleasure, end quote. One of the facets of the case brought forth in Jones's trial was the manner in which he murdered Flory Little. Jones cut her throat and bled her out into the family's kitchen sink. When the coroner examined Little's body some time later, he made that comment that only two teaspoons of blood remained in her body at the time police discovered it in the Jones attic. When Flory's mother called looking for young Flory at the Jones residence, Harold had just hid the body, but told her that he had not seen her. Jones spent a total of 20 years in prison and proved to be an unremarkable prisoner. Authorities finally released Jones on December 6, 1941, at the age of 35. After his release, Jones married and had a child. He died on January 2, 1971, of bone cancer. Before his death, he asked his wife at the time that his real name, Harold Jones, should be on the death certificate, not the alias he lived under for so long, Harry Jones. After Jones's death, it seemed that the story of a child murderer just sealed Jones's legacy in British legal history. But in the past few years, historians and investigators have forwarded a new theory about a series of murders that occurred in the 1960s and cast aspersions that perhaps Jones learned nothing from his incarceration. On June 17, 1959, the naked body of 21-year-old Elizabeth Figg was found in a secluded area known as Duke's Meadow, London, England, near the Thames River. She had been strangled and dumped in the area with no clothes or personal belongings about her body. Four years later, on November 8, 1963, the body of 22-year-old Gwyneth Rees, another prostitute in the area, was discovered naked and strangled to death in a rubbish heap near the banks of the Thames River. Prior to the discovery of her nude body, Rees had been missing for more than nine days. The last known sighting of Rees took place on September 29th when she got into a van. Although the authorities could see no link to the murder of Fig four years before, some believed, despite the time that had passed since the first murder, that these two murders were connected in some way. On February 2, 1964, the body of 30-year-old Hannah Talford was found in the Thames River near London by a boat that passed the body. Talford had her stockings around her ankles, her underwear forced into her throat, and some missing teeth. At the coroner's inquest, Talford was found to have drowned, and some doubted that she had been murdered at all. However, the inquest adjourned with the decision of, quote, an open verdict, end quote. On April 8, 1964, Irene Lockwood, a prostitute, 
was found in the Thames River, just a few hundred yards away from where Talford's body had been found, and the coroner listed her cause of death as that of drowning. A few weeks after the discovery of Lockwood's body, a man stepped forward named Kenneth Archibald and confessed to the murdering of Lockwood. The Notting Hill police accepted the confession, and Archibald faced trial at the Old Bailey on June 19, 1964. Archibald changed his plea from guilty to not guilty and told the court that he experienced a period of depression and confusion when he confessed. After 30 minutes, and considering only the evidence of Archibald's confession, the jury found the defendant not guilty and allowed him to go free. Just a few days after the discovery of Irene Lockwood, 22-year-old Helen Bartholomew was found in a garbage heap in Brentwood behind a row of conspicuous houses. The area appeared secluded and gave the killer a lot of space with which to work or defile the body if he chose. The coroner determined that Bartholomew had been strangled approximately 24 hours earlier, and this discovery led authorities to believe that a serial killer was in their midst for the last four years. Because of some of the paint flakes that appeared on the corpse, investigators believed that the murderer may have been someone who worked around paints, a house painter, an automobile painter, etc., and may have stored her body in or near his place of employment after murdering her and then planting the body to be found. If and when the murders would continue is never more certain than on July 14, 1964, when 34-year-old Mary Fleming was found nude, lying dead on the street following the same M.O. as the other four women. Authorities noted that Fleming's dentures were missing and thought she may have been smothered to death. On her body, police found flecks of paint. It seemed that the assailant had no particular pattern he followed when it came to a time frame between each offense. The area remained quiet until November 25, 1964, when the body of Francis Brown was found in a car parked on Horton Street, Kensington. Brown's body appeared to have flecks of paint on the surface of the skin. Friends and relatives of 27-year-old Bridget O'Hara stated that she had not been seen since sometime in January. Authorities discovered her body on February 16, 1965. O'Hara's body was found underneath some bushes and she had been strangled and had some teeth missing. This last murder disclosed more clues as to the identity of the murderer and produced several suspects. Investigators discovered where the murderer had been storing the bodies before he disposed them. The Jack the Stripper murders were investigated under the auspices of Detective Chief Superintendent John DeRose whom superiors in London appointed to coordinate this large-scale investigation and work tirelessly to find the killer. Because of the paint flakes left on several of the victims, over 700 businesses underwent searches and a match was found in a workshop on the Herring Trading Estate, the same area where Bridget O'Hara's body had been found. Police also discovered that the paint spraying workshop located not too far from the Herring Estate had crawl spaces where bodies could be stored until the killer brought them out to be discovered. Additionally, Superintendent DeRose theorized that the spraying workshop exhibited a great amount of heat and therefore some of the bodies appeared almost mummified in appearance. In one of the largest manhunts in British history, detectives and patrolmen interviewed over 120,000 people and took 3,000 forensic samples for analysis. None of these actions revealed anything further about the identity of the killer. Some female officers went undercover into the London streets where they blended in with the local population of sex workers in order to lure out the killer, but to no avail. No further murders had been committed after February of 1965. The case reached a dead end. Superintendent DeRose compiled a list of suspects by first announcing that authorities narrowed the list to 20, then 10, then three. DeRose revealed that a prime suspect in the murders, one Mungo Ireland, worked at the Heron Trading Estate at the time of the murders, but later took his own life by gassing himself inside a garage. In his suicide note, Ireland stated, I cannot stand the strain anymore. Ireland's suicide only raised suspicion that he was, in fact, Jack the Stripper. Although authorities seemed certain that Ireland was the killer they had been searching for, he had only been at the Heron estate three weeks before he killed himself, and at the time of Bridget O'Hara's murder, 
Ireland was visiting his family back in Scotland. Freddie Mills, a former boxer, had also been named as a suspect. He committed suicide with a firearm five months after the last murder. However, even though his death was ruled self-inflicted, his family believed that he had been murdered. A Scotland Yard superintendent, Tommy Butler, also stood accused of the crimes, but later his accuser proved to be a hater of the former police officer, and John DeRose placed very little credence in the accusations. So, where does the principal focus of this profile fall within the investigation of Jack the Stripper? In a recent book authored by British native Neil Milkins, he named Harold Jones as the murderer. His assumption stemmed from the fact that Jones, upon being released from prison, changed his name, not officially though, and moved to a neighborhood just blocks from where the Jack the Stripper murders took place. Jones had been deemed, quote, a psychopath, end quote, but he still remained a danger to women. Furthermore, Jones lived just a few blocks from the Heron Trading Estates and believed to have moved away from the area very soon after Mungo, Ireland. One criminologist believed that Jones's appearance in the area during the Jack the Stripper murders was no coincidence. When dealing with serial killers, there are no coincidences. Jones's methods from the first murders and the ones committed between 1959 and 65 shared some similarities. Did Jones learn to kill more efficiently while in prison as a budding serial killer? Or did he live a quiet life in the hopes he wouldn't be recognized? Some historians also tried to link Jones to the Little Red Riding Hood murder of Muriel Drinkwater, who was found dead in 1946, having been sexually assaulted and shot to death. Granted, this is not the same signature that Jones used within his previous murders, but yet historians and criminologists still try to associate Jones with the Drinkwater murder, as well as the murder of Sheila Martin, some 250 miles away. With respect to the Drinkwater Martin connection, as recently as 2019, DNA effectively eliminated Jones from consideration in the Drinkwater Martin murders. However, he still has not been eliminated as a suspect for the Jack the Stripper murders. However, the area of Abertillery has never forgotten the murders of Frida Burnell and Flory Little in 1921. And as recently as 2008, local officials sought to honor the victims by restoring their resting places. Although the saga of Harold Jones is not that well known, had he not been detected as a young man, there is no telling how long a killing spree could have continued and there is no certainty as to the lives that were saved with his incarceration. However, serial killers like Jones do not stop unless forced to do so. With his release in 1941, law enforcement could have maintained a closer watch on his activities and perhaps the Jack the Stripper murders became Jones's last hurrah, so to speak. This has been A Moment in Crime. If you've enjoyed this presentation or any other presentation on this channel, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell in order to receive notifications on any further offerings on this channel.